So Mark asked me to talk about um, the farm bill and some effects that it might have on hemp production. And I think Katie did a really good job um, earlier this year and last fall going over that. And um, we'll do that. And then I'll talk about just some uh, things that I experienced and I've seen getting started. I'm gonna be real light on the agronomics because we have a really good opportunity with, with Bill and Richard, two growers that are growing and doing a good job. So we finally have an alternative commodity that looks viable uh, in a challenging time. I spent a lot of time in East Tennessee because uh, I hired on as a tobacco specialist and then the specialty crops with the hemp was, was added on shortly after. And if anybody is, it, Burley tobacco is tough now. Dark tobacco is still pretty good, pretty steady, but burley tobacco, especially in East Tennessee, is falling off and there's some folks hurting out there. So uh, it is a challenging time in all crops, particularly uh, tobacco and some of those crops. Okay, so they just signed, uh, what kicked this whole thing off was section 7606 of the 2014 Farm Bill. And it was a research pilot program <clears throat> that almost hit the ground. Um, there, 2015, 2016, we were mainly looking at fiber and grain rather than uh, extract, CBD, but there were some uh, pioneers that looked at that. So uh, about 2016, 2017, really started looking at, at extract. 2018 Farm Bill, Section 297, hemp has been removed from the Controlled Substances Act and uh, also removed the popular hemp products, uh, hemp CBD from the Controlled Substances Act. So that's a, that's a big deal. Um, I read that Farm Bill yesterday again and um, we really don't know how it's gonna change things. There's some stipulations in there where there's a year from the time it was signed until the old section 7606 from, from 2014 is repealed. Um, <clears throat> I just got an email this morning from one of our deans about the <clears throat> Agricultural Marketing Service is gonna be in charge of, of hand, handling some of this uh, new face of, of hemp under the 2018 Farm Bill. So there's some, some things going on, probably the, the biggest area of concerns, FDA and what role they'll play in regulation, what kind of decisions are made. Other changes, uh, now with this 2018 Farm Bill and hemp's a crop, hemp farmers will have access to crop insurance, USDA programs, and grants. Um, and states cannot interfere with the interstate transport of hemp or hemp products. Uh, but in, the, in that email I got today, um, this USDA email said to make sure people talk to the state authorities wherever they're going through about their specific rules regarding this. So uh, everything's not figured out. Well, there's some stories out there of uh, some hardships on interstate transport, and uh, I think I think there's still some more settling things to do. FDA continues its jurisdiction over regulation of ingestible and topical hemp products. I was in uh, Colorado Friday and Saturday at the it's a Northern Colorado Hemp Exposition. It's more of a trade show, but I, I think one of the biggest areas of concern for the the hemp community is what what is FDA going to do? Uh, they had their main administrator Scott Godlib. He's resigning. Uh, he just released uh, a statement yesterday about the FDA. So they're in a tough spot. <clears throat> you know they have a job to do, which is protect the public health, and. Um, they're getting a lot of pressure from legislators to, to let this CBD go through as a, an ingestible, uh, <clears throat> as a, a dietary supplement in foods, those kind of things. But uh, there's some hurdles they have and he outlined those, those considerations there. So now CBD is the active ingredient 
in a pharmaceutical product called Epidiolex. And um, so you can get a prescription for that. Actually, my son, he just got taken off seizure medication, but he had absence seizures. And when we would go to Vanderbilt, I asked the, the, the neurologist, excuse me, there two years ago about if they were looking at CBD for seizures. And she said that they were, but one of their biggest problems in getting CBD in was consistency of product. And uh, so that was causing Vanderbilt problems. And with Epidiolex, I ran into a gentleman, and I'm not, I'm not for or against, I'm just telling you, I ran into a gentleman whose child had seizures. He was prescribed Epidiolex, $15 a month. He's doing great. So, you know, I, I see room for both, and it looks like, according to Scott Godlib and the indications, it, it <clears> looks <throat> like, and who knows, but they're gonna pursue maybe a threshold mark, or at least investigate it. They've named a special team where, when you have a pharmaceutical, that active ingredient's not to be included in dietary supplements and foods anymore, and that's what we have with CBD now. But it, it looks like they're open to and appointing a task force uh, where there'll be a threshold mark, possibly, just stay tuned, under that mark, um, you know, the, the foods, the tinctures, the things like that will be allowed over the threshold. It becomes pharmaceutical more under FDA's jurisdiction. So that's what they're looking at. They're always also looking at legislative solutions that'll work faster than uh, this process will be. So stay in touch with that. It changes every day. Uh, also what's going on, Tennessee submitted their plan to the USDA on how their program is gonna work. Uh, there's some things that the plan must contain. Uh, some legislation passed recently. I would just say stay tuned to Tennessee's program. Go to their website on the TDA. Uh, there could be some changes coming up. We did a lot of informational grower meetings last year with TDA. Over 3,500 attendees across the state. We had one here. Uh, man, what a difference a year makes. So, that's, uh, that's how many licensed growers we had in 2015, 16, 17, 2018, and then 2019. And Katie told me yesterday we're actually closer to that 3,000 mark. So uh, we have a, a lot of growers. There are going to be a lot of questions. Remember that uh, now there may be a, a cost share opportunity with TDA. Also remember now that... Uh, with, with hemp, we don't have any registered pesticides. A lot of people are gonna be leaning on tillage. Um, but remember, with hemp, you're still bound if you have a, con a conservation plan, conservation <laughs> compliance. If you're planting hemp and, and doing practices that uh, erode the soil, violating that con conservation plan, breaking that conservation compliance, um, then you could jeopardize all your other programs. So uh, it, would, it would be good to, uh, you know, start dialogue with, with NRCS and just keep track of, of that. All right, there's their website. So if you have any questions, go to uh, TDA's website about regulation, about movement permits, uh, things like that. Call Katie. A couple of things to remember, non-viable hemp, it's uh, not capable of reproduction or actively growing. Stalks, leaves, flower, extracts, viable hemp, viable seeds, clones, seedlings, cuttings, growing plants. So at a farmer's market, these kind of things are allowed. Uh, they're non-viable, but at a farmer's market, viable plants are not. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, getting seed. You know, grower's responsibility to find seed. I got an email this morning from an agent saying that uh, they had heard that there weren't any more seed or plants, but there are. You just, you have to look for them. There's a lot of good suppliers and they're out there and there's some people getting geared up right now uh, to provide plants. So just, just stay tuned. Um, I think she covered this really good there. If you have any questions, just remember security. 
there's our contact information. If you have questions about transport, regulation, permits, uh, programs that you can be enrolled in, uh, talk to her. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is, is hemp today and controlling what you can because there's just a lot of uncertainty out there. So, you saw the, the chart, record number, I think, in the U.S. and Tennessee for sure this year. Every, every hemp state has a lot more growers this year and a lot more licensed acreage. I think Tennessee, the licensed acreage is about 40,000 acres, which is what Kentucky is. Um, we won't grow 40,000 acres of hemp. I, I'll be surprised if we grow 10,000. But still, 10,000 acres is a lot of hemp. Um, this, uh, this is driven by the popularity of, of hemp extracts now. Uh, hemp for extract, CBD, that's, that's what is driving everything at this point. Although there are breeding efforts for fiber, there's fiber efforts, uh, there's grain efforts. <clears throat> You're gonna see, <clears throat> and this is just me, but it's going on. I think as we go on, um, and there's all uh, there's also production models out there where we're going to see uh, one crop of hemp furnish extracts, fiber, and seed. And uh, there's a lot of things going on. It's going to, I think, change rapidly. There is potential for high net returns. Um, and then I think it's driven too by. It's just a cannabis movement. I mean, a lot of this hemp was started by this, this hemp movement in 2014, 2015. The United States is a little, a little unique in the term we had hemp production years and years ago, and then cannabis uh, played a big part in the, in the 60s, and people are infatuated with, camp, with cannabis. It's just... Uh, the way it is. So I think, you know, people ask me if hemp's going to be like emus or prawns or switchgrass. I don't think so. I think hemp, I think hemp's going to change. It's not going to look like it is five years from now. I don't think it's going to look like it does today, but I, I think hemp and cannabis are here to stay. Uh, there's many positives that's come through this. I mean, improved quality of life from these uh, hemp products that are being marketed. If you don't have to talk to many people to find somebody that really believes in this product and what's it, what it's done for them. Uh, diversity. There's, there's people that, it's been a good thing. Uh, there's people coming together that would, uh, from different walks of life, uh, that probably wouldn't intermingle. Um, if I met people not like me, you know, in this, and it's been a really good thing and this coming together is I think helped this hemp production there's a a lot of people from a lot of walks of life that uh, can contribute to this uh, new opportunities so whether it's plant suppliers um, products distributors there's just a lot a lot of things going on and uh, I think it's again it's not going to just stay like it is now there's going to be new crops we have Right now we have uh, one plant, hemp, cannabis, and uh, you know the fiber market's going to develop. the The seed part's going to develop, and we're still going to have hemp for extract. So a lot of things coming on board, but it is <clears throat> it is challenging. Um, it's high risk, and you know all agriculture. We tried to say that last year: corn, beans, tobacco, cattle. It's all high risk. Dairy, uh, you just ask those folks. And uh, it's all high risk. So a new crop that is under a new farm bill, we don't know what the FDA is going to do. We don't have the tools that we have for other crops. We don't have the data base. Uh, it's going to be high risk. And uh, with all these new acres and all these new growers getting in, um, We'll see what prices would do, but if you, not picking on cannabis or anything else, but if you just look at history and crop production, what happens is eventually prices go down, efficiency goes up, the big get bigger, there's consolidation, and it gets more challenging for smaller producers. So I would say if you're a smaller producer, 
um, you know, look ahead where you want your place to be and, and look at things like co-ops and ways to uh, strengthen your position in an ever-changing climate. FDA regulation, again, I would just encourage you to, uh, I can't say it any, any better than FDA could. I, I think the most recent best thing you could do is just look up yesterday's release that Scott Gottlieb did with FDA and he was very thorough in, in his, uh, you know, his vision for how they're gonna look at this and, and what they're gonna do. And nobody knows. Uh, nobody knew in Colorado. Nobody knows now. But that's one of those things that uh, are, is out of our hands. Except there's going to be a public hearing uh, in May. A public comment period. So, uh, okay, increased hemp production. We talked about that. What effects is it going to be? Interstate commerce. It's not just Tennessee, but it's Colorado and other states. Interstate commerce, this hemp from other states. Uh, that, that may be, whether it's organic, whether it's higher quality, whether it has qualities that uh, people are looking for, but it's, <clears throat> it's changing things, not just in Tennessee, but it's, it's changing things in all the hemp states. So now, because of interstate commerce, we are working together with other states, but we're competing with them too, because they're producing a solid hemp product as well. Consolidation, you know, if you, if you talk to people out west, it's already occurring, and uh, it just happens in agriculture. So uh, that's a challenge, some uncertainty, and then evolving production and market preparation practices, uh, evolving production models. So right now I know of, of one production model that doesn't use female-only plants. They use a system where there's male and female plants in there, which is a, is a threat to people who spend a lot of money on clones and feminized seed and seedlings because you don't want pollen drip. But uh, this weekend, there's more than one and some pretty big, you know, pretty big players looking at similar production systems. So um, we're all gonna have to coexist, but uh, I would just say that over time, over time, I think it would not surprise me if there is a movement toward direct seeding, where right now there's, it's a transplant, uh, pretty much transplant crop, transplanted crop, crop. but uh, I know that uh, there is now investment in looking at direct seeded models because of the efficiency and, and some things like that. So. Again, it's, it's just a challenge. Market preparation practices, uh, I think that'll change. Drying, curing, there's already dryers coming on board. Lack of production data, recommendations, and nobody feels this like the univer university does. Uh, so right now we have unproven genetics. We have a year's worth and we have a good idea of what, in Tennessee, what it did last year, but one year's data can make a fool out of you. But we have an idea, I think we have some really good varieties and they will continue to be evaluated. But then there's, there's some stuff out there that's being marketed that uh, is not what it says it is. And so um, you just have to be aware of that. There's practices, because we lack production data and years of experience, uh, there's a lot of practices being shared in confidence that we just don't know. Uh, and, and recommendations the same way. I heard over the weekend about a, a big operation in Colorado who hired a consultant and that consultant didn't really know what the consultant was supposed to know. So how do you, you know, how do you vet those kind of things? Uh, you know, right now I believe it is a get what you pay for. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, there are some people that just want your money, just want your time, just want your land. So you gotta protect yourself, that's part of the risk. And then I think there's a lot of people that may seem like that, but really they have good intentions. Things, it's so early, sometimes things just don't work out. The good thing, most people are good. We have people, two people talking pretty soon that uh, are very experienced in hemp and uh, you can learn from them. We have experience ranges ranges from none, no experience, to fundamentally 
expert. They're sound and timely, and, uh, and they want to help you. So take advantage of that. And uh, there's so many people out there. So while we may not have university recommendations and years of experience, there's a lot of observations out there, a lot of people that succeeded. And uh, like Mark said, it, it is a team effort, a community effort. We have some pioneers today that are gonna speak of the industry that's helped identify what works now. And they're willing to come here uh, for nothing and, and speak to you. Um, right now, there's, and I think it's gonna be that way short term, there's a lot of different ways to be successful, but you have to hit your mark. You have to hit your fundamentals. You gotta be agronomically sound and timely. And uh, it may not be optimized, but it's working. Um, you know, we have a way. So minimize your risk. And, uh, you know, I think about for years, I would go to a bookstore and read this book and not buy it because I thought I wanted to ride a motorcycle. And I finally bought that book and read it and then uh, took a motorcycle. You're going to have a wreck on a motorcycle. You know, you got it's dangerous. And uh, what they say if you're going to ride a, a motorcycle is take that risk down to a level you can accept. And if you can do that, then do it. And I think hemp farming's the same way. So I think first you need to read all you can about it. You know, here was a writer's course where uh, you've got experience, you got people doing it, get to know them, get involved with the Tennessee HIA, uh, learn, and then before you invest in it, then when you think it's for you, then get one and go out there. And, and I may still get walked out after I've done this and have some experience. It's just the way it is. So uh, focus on what you control, can control. You can control what genetics you buy. Take the extra time, identify reputable suppliers. You can control where you put it and how you prepare it. Fertility, pest management, uh, it's just a lot of work, but you can control that equipment, infrastructure, labor. Know how much labor it's gonna take, how much time. You can control your scale. Don't start off too big. And before you get very far into planning, you have to know your bottom line. The people that part of that 2,780 or 3,000 are experienced producers that went into it knowing what they had to make. And uh, that's where you have to be before you address some of these other things. Uh, you can control what you do. It doesn't have to snowball. So, and it can feel, it's gonna feel like that. You know, when it gets rolling, it's, uh, it can feel like it's gonna get away from it. So make decisions based on fact, not emotion. Fact check everything. Everything <clears throat> you hear, including what I say, have a plan, have a market. Locate a market, uh, and then know your abilities, uh, requirements, the bottom line, and don't overcommit. Here's some two really good tools. Iris Kui, am I saying her last name right? Kui. Kui. C U I. C U I. That's how you spell it. But Iris is great, and uh, she's with UT Extension. She's developed a budget in Excel. She's summarizing it right now. The great thing about it, it's in Excel, and you can change things. So I changed to fifteen hundred plants per acre here, and uh, I didn't change the price, but you can. So you can change this to fit your operation. Right down here, I added. $30 per pound of dry hemp material. But she made this matrix too, where, you know, say you're getting $24 a pound, then it tells you what yield you have to have per acre before you're profitable and what that profitability, profitability level is. So a really good tool, the University of Kentucky has a, they've just released a budget too. They have one for this kind of direct seeded CBD model uh, one for the tobacco production model, one for plastic culture. Iris has one for plastic culture too. Both really good, really similar. Uh, so I would say don't just use one, use, use both. So you can go to the University of Kentucky Industrial Hemp site. There's a link there for that, but use both. Uh, who you associate with? Associate with reputable people, uh, partners, suppliers. There's a lot of partners, vet them. Suppliers, vet them. Processors, distributors, know who you're working with. Uh, get involved with the TDA, the Tennessee HIA. Uh, TSU <clears throat> is doing a lot of work as well. Other universities, you cannot be successful now if you don't network and talk to other people. And you can focus on who you're gonna be. You just gotta, there's, 
Most people are good, but there's a few bad players out there, and uh, don't be one of them. Be reputable, follow through with what you say you're gonna do with these folks up here. Be a good listener. Um, most hemp calls take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And uh, there's only so many of those I can do, Carla can do, Mark can do a day and still get, Mr. Ronnie can do, and still get anything else done. Uh, and, and there's a bunch that come in every day. So uh, be patient when you're talking to folks, understand the time constraints. And then later on, you're gonna, you're gonna be in a situation uh, where you need to pay it forward. So uh, still a small industry name stick. Don't try to get too big. Don't try to do it alone. Keep it simple. Don't overthink it. Uh, some people have talked about cover crops and intercropping. I think if you're an experienced producer or you have relationships with experienced producers, I would call that advanced. Because we, we've been, cover crop termination, particularly with not a herbicide, is tricky. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. There's roller crimpers, there's other things going on. When you start combining a whole lot of other things with this, especially if you're not experienced, you can get in over your head and things may not work out. So if you're gonna try some of those things, keep it small, keep it simple. Uh, if you're not erodible, some people don't agree with me, but it's hard to beat tillage right now. If, if everything's level and you're not eroding, and uh, there is a place for tillage, um, especially at this time. Fundamentals, you know, we may not have hemp principles, but we do have other crop principles and uh, timeliness supplies. Control weeds, that's going to be our biggest reason for attrition this year as weeds are going to take a lot of it don't take shortcuts uh, you got to use organic approaches you don't want to have pesticide residues and other things in your hemp in your product invest in the proven and the allowed or the legal uh, and closely associated associated with that don't limit the marketability of your product play it safe in 2019 it's just going to take hard, hard work. Uh, monitor your crop daily during flowering. If you're not, if you don't have a trained eye, they can hermaphrodite or you may have a male in there depending on your plant or, or feminized seed source. And it, it really is like one day you're all female and the next day you got males is what it seems like. So you have to be out there every day. You do not want pollen drift. You don't want pollen getting over on your neighbor and you're gonna have neighbors this year growing hemp. There's too many. Too many folks around. Fiber, grain, uh, CBDs, in the, the ways when we talk about the flowers, the buds, because the concentration of the trichomes, that's where our CBD and other cannabinoids, terpenes are produced. We have to take care of those. Uh, I'm just gonna give you a couple of pictures and, and go on to, to Bill or uh, Richard. But this is uh, a tallow up in Kentucky, an uh, old picture. You're gonna see it on plastic culture like that. Um, you're gonna see a lot of it like this, and you don't wanna be one of those, but uh, you have to control weeds. This is Clint Palmer. Um, you're gonna see this, and then you're gonna see things like this. Jody Allen, East Tennessee, did a, did a great job. So you're gonna see other looks here pretty quick. Lots of ways to be successful. Um, this is this is a little variety trial we did where we uh, we just checked it, but a lot of ways that you can grow. Keep your eyes out for bud rot. Keep your eyes out for corn earworm. Uh, there's the egg. Uh, you may have some foliar spot. I'm not sure how much of a problem that was last year. And then we're already seeing this was in February the cannabis aphid, and we're hearing of problems uh, in small plants, and um, this is concerning. So this is the only recommendation, it's not a recommendation, <clears throat> suggestion for me. I mean, there's a lot of ways it work. Tobacco, to, tobacco, tomato production model works. Soil test for fertility, heavy metals, pesticides, although I'm trying to figure out what to do with these heavy metal and pesticide soil tests and how that correlates to the actual plant. Populations are gonna range uh, anywhere from low to high. Uh, you need well-drained, good site. Tobacco fertility program works. Lots of labor. Uh, 
We're going we live in the southeast. We're gonna have these problems with pests. Hand harvest. Do not uh, do not underestimate labor. And don't don't count on people just wanting to work in it because it's a camp. <coughs> because they may <coughs> for a half day and then they're gone. So make sure that that you have labor lined up. Uh, make sure you have a dry area to dry, cure, store those plants, uh, and it takes a long, long time to get that process, lots of labor. So, uh, thank you. If Any tobacco producers in the crowd? I know we have a few, so. I think Bill has some experience with tobacco, and that was one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I invited him here today, and I appreciate him coming. And, uh, I'm not going to try to tell you all the things he knows because I probably wouldn't well, do it. It's not, it won't so. take long because it's not much. All right, but the pictures set up here are from his operation, and there's some out in the lobby as well. So, thanks, Bill. Uh, what Dr. Walker talked about earlier is critically important because it's not going to be long when plants are going to start moving around. If you've got plants contracted somewhere, I would be checking them out because mites, root aphids, powdery mildew, a huge, huge problem right now in a lot of grow sites. I know uh, Tennessee Hemp Industry Association, Dr. Walker mentioned them also. It's a fantastic organization, especially in uh, getting to know a lot of the people that have been involved in this industry uh, since its inception. Good place to start uh, networking. Uh, there are some, um, some posts on there about um, pest concerns, um, some things like that. One website, everybody, everybody that's a, a, a licensed grower <clears throat> needs to be following uh, is uh, industrialhempusa.net. That's a .net, not .com. That's Paige Delafranca, and I'm, I know I just destroyed her last name. Say it again, Bill. Paige. No, no industrial industrialhempusa.net. It's an educational forum. That, uh, and she's posting uh, a lot of things on pest management, things like that. It's a, it's a fantastic forum and also a very, very good spot to start networking with, some, uh, uh, with people. One thing I would do, of course, TNHA also, you can go to the Facebook page and post where you're at geographically and start trying to find out who's close by. Two reasons. Uh, a, if you're all growing, say like if you're all growing an indica type or a sativa type or whatever, that you're going to be harvesting at the same time, maybe you can pool your resources and have something better to offer, um, something like that. Also, if they're going to be doing something with seed, especially if it's not feminized, there's going to be a lot of that this year. You need to know who's within a few miles of you because of the potential for cross-pollination. That's going to be, I'm telling you, there are going to be some true Hatfield McCoy issues going on in the state of Tennessee this year. Whatever you're doing, think beyond yourself. Try to consider what your actions are going to do to people that are within striking distance. When I say striking distance, I'm talking about pollen transfer, and that can be anywhere from 7 to 10 miles. What you do can have, an, have a dramatic effect on somebody that has done their due diligence, done the research, spent the money, and if you're trying to take shortcuts, it's going to compromise their crop. Think beyond yourself in this. I mean, you know, things are bigger than you as an individual. Think as a community. Um, but insect infestation, uh, disease issues, a huge, huge concern right now, and it's just going to get worse as uh, obviously weather gets warmer, humidity levels rise. <clears throat> Lost Coast Plant Therapy. That's a very, very, very good product. Uh, natural uh, ingredients, it'll wash clean off. But as far as mites, uh, powdery mildew, won't do anything for root aphids. But these other, it's a proactive product. You need to be ahead of the problem, but it will solve a world of problems. You can go to their website, lostcoastplanttherapy.com. It's expensive, don't get me wrong. Uh, but it, it can solve a huge, huge amount of problems. Lostcoastplanttherapy.com. But 
closer, closer by is Mike and Nemo Sanders. Some of you guys know them already. They produce a product that is comparable to Lost Coast and cheaper. And they're, they're in Jolton, Tennessee. So there is, uh, he does have a product that's, uh, that's close by. <clears throat> is that with Mike and Nemo Sanders? Nemo, N-E-M-O, one of the most impressive individuals I've met, uh, hands down. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to cross paths with them three, uh, six years ago. <clears throat> Uh, mites, um, aphids, not root, root aphids, but uh, aphids, mice, powdery mildew, uh, things like that. The thing about that is, um, and you can look up Lost Coast and it'll give you an application rate. And of course that depends on if you have a problem, the, you know, how intense uh, uh, your infestation is, but it's more of a proactive product <clears throat> to stay ahead of your problems. And if you stay using those, uh, either, uh, well, I know the Lost, Col the, the Lost Coast is a, an ounce per gallon of water and spray liberally uh, late in the day, uh, you know, where you're not dealing with uh, uh, bright sunlight. It, it could cause some burning. Um, but it, it will, um, uh, as, your, as your plants get bigger and your, uh, your amount of foliage increases, obviously your, your application rate is gonna to have to increase. Uh, but that product, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, an ounce, I think it uh, breaks down to about eight bucks an ounce, thousand bucks a gallon. So it's not cheap by any measure. But I will say this, especially on my mid-season varieties, I'm talking about field application. My mid-season varieties that are gonna be more of an indica type, and listen, whatever can go wrong, it will go wrong with an indica. And that could be any type of cherry cross, anything like that. Uh, sweetened is gonna be very, very popular in the state. Uh, same way. A lot of issues that we deal with, foliar issues that we deal with in tobacco are gonna to be, uh, are gonna, show themselves in these mid-season varieties. When you're dealing with those type of mid-season varieties, those indica types again, and I know I'm not supposed to say that, where you have a much bigger, uh, much heavier, denser bud formation, especially something that's coming off early mid-October, mold, 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 mold. It's a massive, massive problem. And even more, no, 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 not more so, but just as damaging in that time of year are the European corn borers. And you know, once they're in that bud, there is not a thing you can do that's not something systemic, which you get to the residual issue. Um, so you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to make, if you're doing something that's a mid-season, um, you're gonna have to be proactive to get ahead of something like that, or you could easily, easily lose 30, 40% of your crop. And beyond losing your crop, all of your, your damage from the, uh, the secretions, everything that's going to rot the bud beyond mildew and, uh, and mold uh, or the, the bud dying from insect infestation is going to be a visual deterrent to somebody wanting to, to buy it. Looks, uh, I mean, visual is so, so critically important now with this huge migration from west to east with the uh, overproduction that way. I've seen some really, really good looking stuff from Oregon. And I've seen some garbage from Oregon too. So believe me, they've got, they've got bad. This is just in one of the greenhouses, um, uh, you know, building mothers. Um, uh, this, when you're deciding what you're gonna do, this is a late season variety, it's a sativa type, obviously. Um, anything that, this variety loads flowers so incredibly late. Uh, it's not even ready. We were in this field the first week of December when we finished up. Uh, it's not even ready to cut until mid-November. And yeah, there's a good chance you're gonna miss Thanksgiving, uh, but, <laughs> The, the, the thing about it is, it loads flowers so late, and it is a mega producer. I'll hit about 3,500 pounds of acre with this variety. 
on 16 acres, um, you're past the insect infestation. It, it, it like most sativa types, it has a smaller, uh, smaller bud formation. It air dries a lot easier. I don't even have to use fans with, with this. Uh, it's not really bothered by disease problems. It is very, very, very forgiving in the field. A sativa type generally is not as strong as far as your CBD percentages or things like that, but it's almost a wash because your production is, is so, so high. Um, so, I, you know, think what you're gonna do um, or, or not so much what you're gonna do or what you're capable of doing. If you've got some type of spray equipment or whatever where you could go in and do uh, <coughs> uh, an application of something like a Lost Coast or a product like Mike and Nemo has, mind you, that's gonna be insanely expensive because you're talking about an ounce per acre and uh, at a larger plant size, you're gonna be doing probably 20 gallons to the acre, something like that, to get ahead of those, uh, those worms. And once they're there, it's not a thing you can do except watch you lose your crop. But it's, and you know, it, with that Lost Coast, you can look at the, uh, you know, you've got uh, isopropyl alcohol, uh, 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 some type of a soy um, uh, oil, uh, peppermint. It's all natural. It washes, it washes clean away. But once again, it's, it, it ha it's proactive. And as far as insects, it smothers the insect. There's your, your control. But once those worms get in that bud, you know, you're, there's nothing you can do. There is a mid-season variety um, that, uh, like I said, it's, it's fantastic that your, your CBD percentages are a lot stronger on these varieties, but once again, anything uh, as far as mid-season, there's, there's going to be some really, really uh, serious issues that you're going to have to stay ahead of. So don't just think, you know, you put it out there and everything's going to be fine. Obviously, weed control is critical. Uh, and that means you have to have a lot of labor. Or if you don't have a lot of labor, plastic. Just something to minimize uh, your problems because uh, if you don't stay ahead of the weeds, you will never catch up. If, they get, if you think, well, I can, you know, I can get ahead of them after the fact, a couple of rains in your history, and uh, you'll, lose, you'll lose your fields. That was, a, once again, that was a field you saw a minute ago. It was uh, 11 acres of uh, that variety, late Sioux. Uh, that, that, that's, that was absolutely gorgeous for people to go and look and see. And, um, but if you, are, if you notice how green the trees are, this is, at, this is at least two months before this crop was ever able to harvest. And it overlapped by at least a foot. And those rows are six feet apart. But first thing, I want, the, the most important thing about this is look at the bottom third of that plant. It's just black because the foliage, the vegetative growth is so dense already that it's cut, it cut light completely out from the bottom third of that plant. That tells you two things. That's wasted time in the field. That's, that's, uh, that's wasted vegetative growth. <coughs> You're going to cut that plant about a foot and a half up because there will be nothing there, absolutely nothing there because there's no light. So if you, something like that tells me I need to adjust my setting, even though that's gorgeous uh, for people to look at, uh, I'm in the field way too early. And all of that wasted biomass, it, it, it's very costly to deal with and you're gonna have to. Uh, that's a different uh, greenhouse and obviously a different type. You can tell by the leaf pattern. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a variety called tangerine. That is a mid-season variety. Uh, has a lot of uh, has a lot of issues, but it's a strong. It's a it's a really strong 16, 16 and a half. The aromatics are really really good, so it's a it's a good variety. But um, like any mid season variety, it has it has problems. Know what you've got, um, and when I say that, uh, find a lab you can trust and is recognized. Uh, Pro Verity out of Massachusetts, uh, tested labs out of Maine is a really really good lab. Um, but, you know, to, to have a good idea of what 
what the value of your commodity is, you gotta know what the numbers are. Now this, this is just plant number three. This is some of my mad science, uh, but the, you know, it's a long story, I'm not gonna go into that. But um, uh, anyway, test, um, uh, test early, know what you've got. And then once again, that's a late test, so I can see you know, how, what the potential of that was. Now this, is, uh, this variety, or this numbered plant, is only valuable to me as part of part of a breeding stock mainly because now this is an indoor grow mind you it hadn't been field tested it will be this year which means the numbers are are going to be low anytime you're in a controlled environment the numbers aren't as strong as they are when they these plants experience natural stress it's stress is good to a certain extent for plants to express uh, certain levels to, to, to be everything they can be. What this started out as, or the female to this, the Delta, uh, the Delta 9 level was a 0 0.26, 0 0.27 naturally, which is way too high to ever grow at scale. It didn't do well in Tennessee, it's just too harsh an environment. The, the CBD percentage on the, the female of this was uh, 16 and a half to 17 and a half. Obviously, what this was crossed with was a Futura 75, which, had, which is what Dr. Walker was mentioning other, uh, earlier, was a, a variety that once upon a time, and it will be used in breeding to uh, improve the numbers for a, uh, something that has uh, three types of value, both in grain, <coughs> uh, very good fiber as far as tensile strength, um, and it does have or did have um, a level of CBD percentage that justified uh, some level of extraction. So anyway, this was just to get this thing off the, this plant off the ground because it, our environment was too hot. The CBD percentage dropped a lot, mind you, uh, right at 12%, but that's respectable. What's more important about this is that CBD to THC ratio of 42.5 to one. You just don't, that, I'm not gonna go into why that's so important, but that, that's critically important. Another thing that is very promising about that is drop the Delta 9 level to non-detectable from a what's a natural 0 0.26, 0 0.27 to non-detectable, which means this is going to be an excellent, excellent plant, uh, plant for um, uh, foundation plant for breeding. Uh, plus, we got that thing to about uh, six feet off the ground, so it, it, it has good, uh, uh, good up and down growth. Now, this is. When I was telling you, showed you earlier that 11 acre field and that dark third, bottom third of the plant, <coughs> same variety, um, different field obviously, much later on. That mid season variety I showed you a minute ago, that, uh, that cherry tang or tangerine, that empty spot over there, that was five acres of it. So that gives you an idea how late <coughs> in the season this is. I did not set this field until August the 5th. Uh, that shows you how long this variety stays vegetative. Even when it's loading flower, it will still keep growing vegetatively. I don't know any other variety uh, that does that. So now I did double my population because I knew August 5th, my number of growing days were very, very limited. And as far as dollars to acre, uh, to acre, this will be, our, be my strongest field. Uh, one other thing I was talking about how, how beneficial stress levels were. Now, when I set this field, now we all know what, you know, what kind of weather we have in August, incredibly hot and dry. Uh, this was a, you know, a live or die situation. We had other things. This is more really research and development uh, just to see what it would do. Um, what this, variety is it, Bill? Lake Sioux. Lake Sioux. This variety uh, in all fields of Lake Sioux that were set from late June to August the 5th, this tested uh, the highest at 14.9%, which is very high for Lake Sioux. Um, and I, I attribute that to stress, uh, both uh, uh, heat and drought. I didn't irrigate it uh, or, or, or anything. It was just uh, put it out there and kept it clean just to see what it would do. And, and it, it, like I said, it's gonna be my best. It's, that's a different one. That's a, uh, plant number nine, once again, I've got good numbers uh, for that to be uh, a foundation plant for breeding. Um, once again, this is a different field of, uh, of late Sioux, set at a different time. 
but you can see how huge those individual plants get. And here we get back to labor and harvest. We were, uh, we obviously, we treat this just like we do tobacco, uh, but pruning shears uh, and each of those plants would be taken down to anywhere from four to six pieces to handle a plant. So when you're thinking, well, you know, a sativa type and I'm, you know, I'm only gonna set 1,400 plants to the acre, that's not a lot. Well, when you have to start figuring out a way to hang that to dry, 1,400 plants turns into a massive, massive amount of area. So the, the, before you decide what you're gonna grow, your biggest concern needs to be, what do I have room to dry? Uh, because that's where the, your, it, everyone's Achilles heel is in a, a proper space to drive. The last 16 acres that we cut, <coughs> now all my greenhouses were loaded uh, with hemp and we stripped them out and refilled them three times. Most of my tobacco barns were stripped out and loaded three times. Tobacco once, mid-season hemp once, late-season hemp, three times. Uh, but the last 16 acres we cut, it took 37,000 square feet of greenhouse space and 20 tobacco barns, both large and small, to hold 16 acres, to give you an idea of how much space it takes. So that's, uh, uh, that's that mid-season bride, that cherry, uh, that cherry tangerine, and that August the 5th crop is to the extreme right of that. But that was, that was one gorgeous field. This was right before, actually, uh, obviously those are my greenhouses and uh, I was lucky enough to be asked to uh, host the field day for the Southern Hemp Expo this past year and uh, this is about the time of the Southern Hemp Expo so um, it was a beautiful 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 most important thing about that field is you don't see a weed anywhere and that's not <laughs> that's not me that's my guys and, and two ladies uh, that helped. I mean, we were jumping back and forth between, you know, 35 acres of tobacco and 26 acres of hemp, just back and forth, back and forth. And they did a fantastic job. Cultivation, and Dr. Walker talked about don't dismiss cultivation. Cultivate, cultivation is critical for this, especially when you're talking about uh, insect management, because that top six laid six inches, I didn't realize this until Cody, Seals, who's with Blue and was talking about this earlier. Um, a lot of insects uh, incubate in that top six inches of soil. Is that right, Dr. Walker? That's, that's and cultivation true. helps control that early on, where if you're trying to strip till or something like that. Matter of fact, I, I talked to Dr. Walker contemplating doing strip tilling and whatever, and he kind of talked me away from that. He, you know, as he said earlier, don't dismiss cultivation. But Site selection is critical when you're having to cultivate constantly because of erosion. Uh, this is just a very, very simple solution I came up with to utilize my greenhouses. Um, uh, just a, a two by four by 12 cut in half, a three eighths inch piece of plywood, inch and five sixteenths pilot hole for those, uh, <laughs> those purling rods. And then we would, uh, you know, we spiked uh, all of that hemp just like tobacco and hung it in these, uh, these greenhouses, and we can dry them down. You need shade cloths, which you can see that one has one on it. Um, we could dry down and have everything ready to come out of these greenhouses within two weeks. Uh, and there, there's just an example, us loading greenhouses uh, uh, spiked on scalpel wagons. And, and it's something that's so important to think about doing. This is, it, this is incredibly expensive. So try to see what you have on hand that you can use instead of going out and buying and buying and buying. Because you can certainly spend yourself into a hole. I've done it all my life, so I can speak from experience. That's pretty much what those uh, houses look like. And you know, it goes up easy, it tears down quick. Uh, and like I said, all of those greenhouses were uh, loaded and stripped out three times. So trying to use your space very efficiently. And if you're limited to space, think about doing early season and a late season and doing like that, where you can double crop your spaces just like a lot of you guys do in tobacco and ladies also, where you're utilizing your space twice, making it more, making it more efficient. You can sit, do the same thing with, uh, with hemp. Hemp is not, not unlike any other 
type of um, commodity, you know, uh, like in tobacco, corn, whatever, uh, to keep from overloading yourself. You're looking for early, mid, and late season varieties, and they're out there. Uh, this is what I showed you, those uh, test results. This was Randy. This is what I was trying to improve because you can see it just didn't do well. The numbers were fantastic, and I'll tell you, uh, the aromatics on this was absolutely intoxicating. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Southern Hemp Expo, I made sure I had a trailer of this cut and over there where all the seating and everything was, and that was the first thing I wanted everyone to do when they got off the buses was go and raise the shade cloth and, and smell the bud, but then rub and smell your hands because it was two completely different experiences. And I'm sure that had to do something with the oils in your hands or whatever, but the young lady, Randy, that actually bred that variety, which she is called Randy, uh, she flew in from Colorado and I met her at the end of the day and that was and probably the highlight of the day. Meeting somebody that had done the hard work, uh, uh, you know, the sweat and equity to make that available. Like I said, it does incredibly well in New York, Colorado, places like that, but uh, not, not here. Don't take that back. <coughs> this young lady is one that needs to be in a greenhouse, in a controlled environment, and it would probably, it would probably do, uh, do really well. Um, once again, we're back to uh, uh, that field. Maybe I get the wrong thing. And this is something you never do. These were mothers where I had cut clones for, um, and there was eight acres of this variety. And I just, I, I guess I get it from my mother. I just can't bring myself to throw anything away. So you, you really don't finish out mothers. They, they just don't do very well. Um, but actually that, that did, that did pretty, uh, uh, fairly well. But you can see what I was talking about earlier as far as the mold. You see, this is still a month away from, uh, from harvest. And you can see how huge that bud formation is. It's almost like your arm uh, there. So you can see why uh, mold is, uh, is such an issue with these mid-season varieties. Uh, rootstock, there are, um, the young lady that I, uh, I supply some of this rootstock, I, it, and I just give it, uh, give it to her, um, and it, it, rootstock has no CBD value at all, but there are components in that, you're going through a hammer mill, almost down to a paste that she uses in some of her skincare products. So, I mean, this is a plant that absolutely from top to rootstock, there is a value in it. Uh, this is my son a couple of years ago. This was his 15 minutes of fame. This picture got in um, uh, a website on the West Coast uh, called bud.com. It was a, a medical, uh, medical marijuana outfit that was doing a, a, a thing on Tennessee and hemp. And actually I took that picture because I need a visual for vegetative growth to determine when I need to shut the lights off to uh, stop uh, and I got him in there, and anyway, he got in bud.com. So that's his 15 minutes of fame. Once again, uh, another field of mid-season variety. Um, but, um, and that is that mid-season variety, and to the left is where we had just set that August the 5th uh, field that did so well. And this has got to be one of the most important pictures up there. Your, the, the need for labor. And of course, I work with the federal government with H2A uh, visa program. Without these guys, I don't exist, whether that be the world of tobacco, uh, nursery production, or hemp. So critically, critically important that if you're going to try to do any of this at scale, you have to have, uh, you have to have reliable, uh, reliable labor. Um, and you're going to see uh, more and more and more of this, um, you know, tobacco barns that uh, are going to be, uh, this is, this is the transition crop. Uh, like Dr. Walker said, this is not going to be the new red meat uh, like the emu uh, was. But, uh, um, and like I said, all of these tobacco barns was uh, tobacco, mid-season hemp, and this is late, late, late November uh, or mid to late November with, um, um, uh, 
late so my my uh, late season sits can you cure it, can you cure it in that barn right there Bill, without fans yeah late season you can mid season any barns that I had <laughs> mid season varieties in I had some pretty heavy fans shoving air through there as possible what I'm going to be doing on my new barns I'm going to be putting really big fans up on the eave on both ends as soon as we fill those barns they're going to be closed up maybe leaving about two inches of crack uh, of, of space under those door plank turn those fans on negative pressure to really pull that down pretty quick i think well one thing that's a that well it depends on what you're doing with it to some extractors it's a problem to some it's a blessing here it's so hot and the sunlight is so bright and so intense it bleaches a lot of the colors out uh, doing this will save a lot of that uh, a lot of that visual because once again we get back to visual um, but some extractors that uh, you know where you've got a really good lush uh, vibrant looking flower uh, when you're pulling that down uh, you're you're pulling all that chlorophyll too it's giving that uh, distillate a little green tint that's a problem for them but if, it, it just depends on what what's going on so some want the flower to look I wish I had a picture of it of so what we're actually stripping on right now which I guess you'd say more seasoned uh, a little harder color uh, a lot of that chlorophyll is already gone so depends on where you're going with it they would rather see that than than see something that's I guess you'd say visually more appealing but um, I know I had something else on here I wanted to say and I don't know what it was Like I said, the industrialhempusa.net is most definitely a website you need to be following uh, this season. Really, really good in the education format. Um, now, Paige, uh, I, 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 she's putting it together a, a, a website for me. Now, she's uh, doing something really important this weekend. She's going to be in Columbia at the Mule Day. Um, we're going to try to get a... Uh, a couple of mules back at the place sometime this season. Uh, and, and I told Tammy Allgood with Channel 8 uh, when we were out in the field, because these plants, they grow vertically so quick. It's not long before tractors for cultivation are just not practical. And you still have quite a space of middle that's going to be a long time to shade out where weeds are going to continue to grow. And you don't have any, any option but hose. And I said, I would give anything uh, if I had a couple of good mules with hair cultivators. I said, with this crop, for what we're doing now, and Dr. Walker is exactly right, within a handful of years, it's going, go, going to go to a seed format, not cloning. Uh, the, the cost and the depressed market that's going to happen uh, is going to force that transition. But as far as right now, with some hair cultivators to you know, really keep these middles clean, and, um, and I told her, I, I said, uh, I promise you this time next year, I said, I'm going to have a couple of mules up here plowing or a couple of horses. And she said, she looked at me and she said, you really hadn't thought about this very well, have you? I said, well, actually, I, I have. And I think my position is pretty solid. She said, all right, let's talk about this. And, and um, she said, OK, let's agree that the only thing that makes a good mule is if you have someone to follow it. I said, OK. <laughs> And she said, let's say a trailer pulls up here now and two mules get off and you tell your wife that one's yours. She said, how is that going to work? And I said, you know what? I really haven't thought about that very well, have I? And she said, no, you haven't. So, um, but Paige is going to, uh, uh, we want to do it just for the, for the photo opportunity and storyline. Um, I know I didn't take up too much time, but that's all I've got. If you guys have any questions. the back of center. Yeah, yeah, I do. And if we're doing a sativa type, we're skipping every other row to get that six foot center. And we're, you know, we're setting our spacing to, to, to skip, whether it's like your mid-season variety where we're setting about 2,400 plants per acre to our late season varieties, what's set early on, which you saw some of those fields, those are set at about 13, 1,400 at the most per acre. Now, when I get to, but don't don't try that August the 5th mess with anything unless you have late sue. I don't know anything that will do that because if you do, that stuff won't get a foot and a half off the ground and there won't even be anything harvestable. But for something where you're very, very limited in your number of growing days, 
I doubled my population. And you saw that, the, 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 the plant shape was perfect as far as a tree, uh, uh, cedar tree type. The light was getting all the way to the bottom. I didn't have those, uh, that bare uh, inner part of that plant because of uh, not getting light intensity. The, the, the stems were loaded tip to, tip to stalk with flowers. So uh, much, much more efficient. But once again, that's just doing it three years and adjusting my setting, trying to figure it out. We'll all be learning three years from now. Well, how many days did it take from set the time to, you know, maturity was ready to cut? Well, uh, that's what you were talking about. Well, I don't, don't ever go to the field before May the 25th. As far as I'm concerned, that's the magic day as far as daylight, uh, daylight hours. And from, so like your mid-season varieties, May the 25th through the, uh, through say like the 10th of June, um, that's going to come off mid-October. Just, you know, it's going to come off mid-October. That the, the late season that I was setting anywhere from the 1st of July to August the 5th, that variety, mind you, that variety, and I don't advise, I don't advise very many people to use that variety, it's not going to be ready to cut until mid-November at the earliest. And that's when the numbers, and I've seen the numbers on that variety move four points within a week. Uh, it, it, it's that critical to leave it out there because if you cut it early, you're not going to have anything. It's not, it's not going to be worth squat. Um, but um, so, you know, uh, third week of July to third week of November. Now there are some early season varieties. Uh, I've got three different ones I, I had approved for Tennessee this year. This will be the first year on them, so I, I really don't know how they're going to react. Yeah. Do you judge your maturity to the trichome or through leaf color? How do you judge your maturity? Color the trichomes. Basically, you're looking so for about 75 percent. They start getting more amberish. Oh yeah, there. yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's a, it's a big window. Uh, meaning it's going to weather. The, the um, from the, the last half of November and the first week of December, uh, it was incredibly cold. We got a lot colder a lot sooner this year for that brief period. And it's just like Tennessee. If you don't like the weather, just wait. And um, uh, but we were still cutting. And like I said, that uh, that late field te had tested. <coughs> Uh, better than anything. So hemp is incredibly resilient and uh, very, very weather hardy. And so there was mid to low twenties. And I know don't don't uh, you can go ask someone else and to say he's lost his mind. Well, I've done it. You know, I've, I've done it several times. Mid to low twenties is not a big issue. Oh, it, yeah. it really is. Okay, good, good, good. You agree with me? Yeah. As long as it's not you know two, three, two, three <laughs> hours a night, not a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal at six o'clock in the morning when we start. That's a huge deal. But um, uh, but no, as far as uh, two three hours a night in mid to low twenties, not not an issue. It'll weather it'll it'll weather through. It's not going to look that great, but but it'll weather through. What you're looking for is there. Uh, it's there. And the rest of the plant is just a carrier for the most part. So anyway. Are you going to be able to stick around for a few minutes? Then? A little bit. Yeah, okay. a little bit. All right. Um, you have I got a website, one more question. Right? Okay. Variety called Franklin. You familiar with it? Actually, Ryan Rush uh, over in Maryville, Tennessee. I, I think uh, I think highly of him, and I know he has done really well with Franklin T1 sweetened. Franklin is very very pH sensitive to make that uh, to to really really do well. And ideally, plant it when. When you say it, uh, no, I know I don't know about Franklin. No, no. I've never, I've never okay. grown it. Uh, Ryan okay. would be someone. Ryan Rush, Rush Farms in Maryville, Tennessee. I know he has Franklin. I'm sure there are several others that also have Franklin, but uh, uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't give you advice on right, that. Thank you. How about one last question? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you going to be playing the straight cat? I'm sorry? Are you going to be planting the straight cat varieties this year? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're uh, cutting clones today. Or we. I'm not. They are. Okay. 
Well, that's probably a good transition. You do have a website. Can you tell them what they might find on your website? Yeah, uh, CorbinScientists.com uh, is a website. You can follow what's going on. Um, and that's linked to industrialhempusa.net, which, believe me, that's a whole lot more important to follow than, than, uh, than my website. Uh, you were replacing your tangerine plants with a straight cap? No. God, no. No, I think the world of tangerine. Still? Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't I? Uh, it's proven. Stray cat's never been grown here. It might be a Randy. It might be another Randy. I know I can generate 3,100 pounds to the acre with tangerine at 16%. So, I, you know, I'm one of those, uh, if, if it ain't broke, uh, leave it alone. Now, tangerine, er, everything else is something that will evolve just like all of these varieties. But if I know that something is proven here, I'm gonna stay with it, at least to a certain, to a certain level. I'll be doing nine different varieties uh, this year. So. The ones that will be to, at, 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 at scale will be the ones that I know what, how it's going to perform. Uh, like legs here. Yeah. He's from Buffalo River Hemp Company. He also has a website and. Uh, he had great success this year, and uh, he does things just a little bit differently, but uh, you know, that's good to know all the different ways that you can do things. So uh, I'll turn it over to Richard. Thank you. I always like going last because I can rely on all the hard work of the other folks and just kind of fill in a few of the holes. Um, one very important thing that was just mentioned was that there's more than one way to do this. You can be successful doing this a number of different ways. The important thing is to look at what you've got, your, your environment, your labor, uh, what seed stock you have, your goals, just like what Eric was talking about, and that's gonna determine you know, what your methodology is gonna be. It may not be the same as the guy down the road. Bill's been very successful, but I can't duplicate his model. I've gotta go with my own model, and a lot of that is due to labor. A lot of the, the rest of that is due, due to, you know, the type of plants we're using, the methodology. So that's what we're going to talk about. So it's great to have the two, kind of the two main streams of thought or production represented here so you guys can look at it and determine. It may be a mix <coughs> of what you decide. You may decide to take some from what Bill is talking about, some from what I'm talking about, and have something to move forward with. The bottom line is we're all still learning. This industry is still developing. What works in Colorado doesn't necessarily work here, so we get a lot of experts from Colorado. It doesn't necessarily work here. You get experts from out west, doesn't necessarily work here. What you've got to be careful of, too, is all the internet experts that have never grown anything more than what fits in a closet, but all of a sudden they're experts on how to do this large scale. So be very careful where you get your information from. Um, we formed our company uh, back in 2017 in order to explore CBD production uh, primarily for one of our children who had TBI. Um, that's kind of what got us into this. What kind of got us in large scale, well that was somewhat of an accident and somewhat of just, you know, recognizing what this could possibly be. And the next thing you know, we're in it full scale. Um, what I'm going to do is just kind of run through uh, a little bit more detail about the growing process, about the planting process, because you all have already, you know, <coughs> been into the carrot, eating the carrot, and you're in this. So uh, let's we'll get started here. Um, just one of our plants there went during veg state. This is kind of a slide here, <laughs> kind of appropriate, because this is what you, you're potentially going to run into. <laughs> Except now, we're having to put security up because the kids are breaking in and stealing CBD on purpose. They want CBD so that they can use that with the marijuana to get the effect that they want. So it's not just, uh, this weed sucks. They want that weed for the CBD in order to deal with uh, really high dollar stuff that they're purchasing. Uh, this is... Basically, the day we got our seeds, this is in the parking lot of a gas station up in Franklin. 
it was really weird, really sketchy. Um, I was expecting, you know, black SUVs to come around the vehicle any moment. But you can see right here we've got uh, some frosted lime. That's the button I need. Yeah, we've got 3,000 of frosted lime seeds and 1,325 of, of assisted in gold. Now these seeds came out of Oregon, and similar climate, um, similar conditions. Uh, highly feminized. We had 6,500 plants in the field. Um, had two feet, had two that went into hermaphrodite. Um, got those out of there real quickly. Just had three or four plants around them that had some had some uh, pollination occur. So, like what Bill was saying, you've got to be in your field every day. You've got to be looking for these things to happen. Purchasing clones is not guaranteed. You will not have hermaphrodites. Stress produces hermaphrodites. Depending on how good the <coughs> genetics are in that plant is gonna, is gonna determine how resistant to becoming a hermaphrodite uh, that, that phenotype is. So you gotta be real careful. So being in that field every day, watching those plants, looking at them uh, is, is very key. Um, if you know what you're doing, you can go out and look at your plants, look at the leaves, Look at the way the plant is behaving, and you're going to know what that plant needs. Uh, you wouldn't know it from it's a little too far away, but even up close, these had horrible germination in the 20 percentile range. These had 98 to 99 percent germination. So even though this is a very reputable seed supplier, some bad seed got out right here. Now they took them back and replaced them without problem. But it just goes back, you've got to have a solid way of, of doing whatever you do, a consistent, repeatable way, whether you're doing seeds or clones. <coughs> Here's our seeding operation. So what we do is May the 15th, we put the seeds in the pots. June the 15th, we put the seedlings in the field. And the reason we don't go earlier than that, start earlier than that, is because the size, it's too big. Um, they start causing, they start breaking in the field. Because these plants are getting six to eight feet tall, six feet in diameter. We, the majority of our plants had about five pounds per plant. Now, you know, we, we paid a lot of attention to them. We fed them properly. Uh, it was just ideal conditions for them, so they did very well. So what we're doing is these seeds, the, night, the day before, we took all these seeds in this bag here, and we pre-soaked them for about 12 hours in a cupboard in the kitchen where it was dark. Now you don't want to go longer than that because if you go longer than that, they're going to start sprouting in and water. Start in water, yes sir. And you're going to start <clears throat> knocking off the little bud that's coming out of the seed. And then that's useless. So 12 hours prior to this operation, we had them in a Ziploc bag. What we were going to do, you know, a couple thousand seeds that day. And you know, you're doing 2,000 seeds by hand in these containers. You're gonna be a cross-eyed cat by the time you're done. But the whole the important thing is, is getting those seeds pre-soaked, making sure <coughs> that this mix in here, we use an MP growers, organics growers mix with mycorrhiza. So you don't wanna use uh, you know, your, your favorite mulch blend from the, the garden center. You want to use something that's dry, that hasn't been wet, that's been sealed up because you're going to get fungus gnats. You know, a lot of folks have lost their seeds to fungus gnats. They never saw anything come up because they didn't use a good, clean uh, growing media. Now this growing media has a mycorrhiza in it. And what we do is we put it in these containers. These containers, it's an SC10 from Stewie and Sons out in Oregon. And they're actually cheaper than Dixie Cups. And the beauty of them, they go in this rack, and this rack holds, I think it's 98, and it fits right on, your, right on our planters. Because when you're talking large volumes of seeds, you don't want to be in Dixie Cups, because Dixie Cups, the second most famous thing they do besides hold your drink is they tip over. <laughs> and so these are not going to tip over in that rack. These cups are real nice too because at four weeks, when your seedling is moving on up, that root is also going down. 
So whatever you have above that pot, you have a root going down. And the beauty of it is that when you put this in the field, there is almost no transplant shock if, you, if, you, if you're careful. And uh, I'll show you later here in just a minute how we're going to plant those in the field. So these pots have ribs in them, so you don't get root wrap. And they also have uh, air holes here <coughs> for air pruning. So you're going to get a nice, uh, sturdy root ball that's going to hold together, and you're going to get a real healthy plant. Um, <coughs> key is to get these things soaked real well before you plant them. We soak them four or five times to make sure that all this growers mix, there's no dry spots in them. Then we use a little devil stick, which is a broom handle with a piece of quarter inch dowel in it, and we make a whole depression in that soil and drop the seed in there, and then come back immediately and once you finish putting seeds in the tray, then we go back and cover them all up. Ideally, how deep? Half inch deep. Half inch. Yes, sir. What did you say your growing media was again? MP Organics with Mycorrhiza. And you can get that at the, at the co-op. Deerfield Supplies in Kentucky yeah. is the best place to get it. But if you threaten a co-op with Deerfield Supplies, you'll get a pretty good deal. <laughs> so, so, and the co-op's usually a whole lot closer. Yes, sir? Couldn't hear good back here. Uh, I'm sorry. That's fine. So from the time you plant that in that cook till it's ready, you said it's how long? Four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. So you notice we aren't planting in a greenhouse. We've got filtered light coming in here. And so what we do is we leave it in here for a week until we see that little plant coming up, that little seedling emerging. And then what we're going to do, once we see the seedling emerge, we're going to start hardening it off. And so what we do is we put it out in an hour of morning sun. And it's not you know, from 10 to noon. We stay away from 10 to, 10 to 2 is where we stay away from. So we're going to put that thing out at 8 o'clock in the morning until about 9, 9.30, and we're going to put it back in the, in the barn, and then we're going to do that in the evening. We're going to do that for the first week. And then we slowly build on that time period over the next three weeks, so that by the fourth week, they're outside. How so they're, much, like, how, what larger, or how, what was the time increment that you build over the next four weeks? We'll do, we'll do uh, an hour, we'll put that in about an hour every week. Okay. So as we enter the third week, they're getting, you know, we're, we're keeping them out of the hot midday sun. And as they start the fourth week, they're out there the whole time. And what you're going to notice, you're going to notice the stalk of that plant is going to start to get hard. It's going to have some little hairs on it. And once it starts to get hard, then it's about ready. And it'll, get, it'll probably get its third or fourth set of leaves on it. Then it's going to be able to handle full sun. Before that, it's going to, you know, full sun, it's going to burn them up. Now these plants, this is about the only time they're delicate, is right when they're seedlings at this stage. It, they're pretty easy to kill. Um, once they get in the field, we lost more from insects, the, the occasional fly-by insect that would just clip off a, a stem at this stage than we ever did in the field. Once they got in the field, we only lost two or three plants to you know, I don't know if it was a beaver or a pterodactyl. I mean, I don't know what it was, but we only lost two plants to whatever came by. It. Whatever it was, it didn't like it because it never came back. So, so real key to get make sure these things get hardened off properly and you don't kill them because um, that can happen. The other thing is you don't want to overwater them. If you overwater them, you're going to do just as much damage if you don't water them. So. The key is, is you aren't going to water them more than once every three days. And you're going to feel that soil. You want to put your finger in that soil and feel it. If it feels damp, then don't water it. If it's starting to feel a little dry, then you go ahead and water it. Um, as you enter into the fourth week, you can put a weak fertilizer on these. And we use Fox Farms. And so we'd be using, we would be using the Grow Big which is a liquid fertilizer for cannabis. And you're looking at about one teaspoon per gallon. And then we water the plants with that fertilized water. You don't want to over fertilize them, but 
you've got to put something in there because they've already used up whatever was in that pot and soil by that time. What week did you say to start that? Week four? Yeah, it, going into week four. Now you can look at your plants, and this is something real key because everybody's soil is different, everybody's conditions are different. <coughs> you've got to look at that plant and see, but it's going to tell you what it needs. If, if it's based on the color of the plant or how it's looking, it's going to tell you if it needs water, if it needs food. And you've got to be real. Into, you've got to get in tune with that. And there's lots of there's lots of good sites on the internet where you can look at. And don't take all your information from one site. You want a kind of a, a consensus of opinion whenever you make a move. So look at what the, the plant looks like. I, I've got some leaves that are yellowing around the edges. Okay, what is that? Mm. And go and look and do some research. Build your knowledge base. And then, then you can address the problem. Yes, ma'am. Question: As a first year grower in Tennessee soil, I mean, I grow in Mississippi, a lot different. What do I need to do to prepare my soil, or what should I expect to need to do, other than obviously cut it, till it, and all that kind of stuff? As far as like pH and. Okay, six point five pH around that. But the best thing to do is get with your extension agent and talk with him because he's going to be more familiar with your local conditions. And he can kind of go off of a general, here's a general consensus of what your soil needs to look like, where it needs to be. So let's see here. This is, a, this, yeah, we're smiling. So this is the beginning of the day because by the end of the day, no one wants to talk to each other. And this is the plant. This is about oh, about two weeks in. So, and then this is what we've got. We had them in stages. So this year we'll be putting a whole lot more in. We'll do them probably all at once, rather than doing them, you know, two thousand a week or so. So you can see the 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 range and age of, you know, they're just you can't even hardly see them, but they've just come up. This is in the morning, early. These are the others. They're a couple weeks older. These are, you know, into the third week. Real simple. Saw horses, some two by fours with plywood, and then those racks on top. Because you're moving a lot of them in and out, in and out. Another look at all the plants getting ready to go in. So you can see here, they're starting to get that coloring of the stem there. So these are starting to get more mature, more hardened. Is there anything you can do to keep them from stretching? Yeah, now that's, yeah, that's light. They're just like tomato plants. They're going to stretch <coughs> gangly. And the problem with that, there's two things that happen with that. Number one, they aren't maturing like they're supposed to. And number two, that stem is really easy to cook when it, when it really gets leggy like that. So that's why it's real important to keep them in that light, put them out in the light right away in the morning and in the evening and start growing that period. If you see them starting to stretch, they need more light, put them out a little longer. Again, this is another, this is another reason why you've got to be really in tune. This is not a crop you can kind of just forget about it and walk away. You've got to be on top of this and very proactive because it will get away from you quick. Um, <clears throat> this is the equipment we use to plant. That's a rain flow, you know, rain flow, just Google them, rain flow. And that's a model 1600 transplanter. It's a, it's a water wheel transplanter. It's got a wheel here uh, with a spike on it. And what we did is we just, we made the spike longer. They don't make one from the factory long enough. We just made it longer in the shop where we could get a hole deep enough to take that 10 inch pot and not fold it back up on itself. Because what we're looking for is going in the ground and then coming back the next day and seeing that thing grows, it's already grown a half inch. Not, no transplant shock. Um, and then this right here is a, a uh, raised bed plastic mulch player, model 2550. And so that's what we use. And then these tanks here, what we did is when we're uh, we put about two teaspoons per gallon of that grow big in these tanks here. 
and then you control the amount of water that goes in each hole. So we're putting water in the hole that's in the plastic and then putting that plant down in there with it. And then this is, this is what you get when you're putting your plastic down right here. Now this width right here is not nearly as wide as it seems. This one I think was about, we we're just getting started and trying to sort all the bugs out and figure out what we were doing. But that one I think is about 40 inches from plastic to plastic. This, this year we'll have roughly seven feet from plastic to plastic. Because what we're going to do in this row right here between the plants, we're planting buckwheat, a white buckwheat. And the reason is, is because we have a Johnson grass problem. And I spent the majority of my life last summer walking behind and cultivating this row after row after row, hour after hour, day after day, trying to, you know, to stay ahead of the weeds, to stay ahead of the Johnson grass. So if something has to compete with that to keep it down. And we are going to till, we're going to use tillage, but we're going to use what's called a field cultivator from Umber Earth. And what it does, it's got s tine harrows, a root breaker, or a dirt clod breaker, and then a basket that's got a serrated wheel on it. And so what we'll do is every six to eight weeks, when the buckwheat starts to seed, that's when we go, oops, that's when we go over it with the field cultivator. Let's go over it with the rope. Now we may have to use a flail mower to knock it down first, but we're going to do that field cultivation where we agitate those top three, four inches of soil, break it up real good, put the green manure back in the soil. And so we're doing two things. We're competing, or actually three things. We're competing with the weeds to keep them down. We're putting nutrients back in the soil. And then we're also pulling in some beneficial insects, birds, that sort of thing, to help us with our pest control. Um, let's see here. Just another. It's supposed to be a video, so it's not working. Um, the one thing we did find out with these pots is the, uh, the plants won't come out of them. So he had to slice them all down the side. Now they're reusable, thankfully. So. We'll, we reused them several times last year. We'll reuse them again this year. Um, so what we do is we set this in the river before we plant it and let it soak completely, and then take it out, put it on the transplanter, and then we would drive through the field and transplant it. This is called learning how to use a transplanter, which took us a few rows. But once we got everything set right and working right, it, it motored right along real nicely. So our spacing is about every six feet between the plants. And that, that we're gonna hold this year to that space. And that was a really good spacing. We still got good light penetration. And the other key thing you're thinking about is not cramming all your plants in a small area because these need airflow. They need a lot of airflow. So depending on your location, if you're you know on the top of a mountain in Kansas, you could probably plant them right on top of each other and you're gonna get plenty of airflow. But this is in a, a river bottom and we don't get as much airflow as, we, as we'd like. So that's another reason to spread these rows out. The other is harvest time is a whole lot easier. Pest management is a whole lot easier. Your plants are gonna mature much better because they're getting more light. So there's a whole host of reasons for that. But as you spread out, now you've got more area, you've got to control weeds in too. So that's why we're planting that, a competing crop, the buckwheat with it. And then this is a, a picture of my daughter and my son's on the other side planting. <coughs> so we could plant in low two. If I went from 1,200 to 1,500 RPM, they knew it. So they had me on a short leash because, of course, I'm trying to get more planted more you know, quickly. But uh, you can, two people can keep up at about on low, low twos. So it's mainly just developing the hand-eye coordination to actually take the plant out of the pot, put it in the, put it in the hole, cover it back up, here comes the next one. If you switch sides, you basically have to drop back down to low one again and 
creep along until you, the muscle memory gets there. Yes, sir. You're, that's a good question. You're putting in about a cup to a cup and a half of water, not much. And you don't want to be planting in soup, but you want to be planting, you know, if it's, got, if it's a little soft and you can move the earth around, you know, that's, that's really nice. The other thing is you don't want to put these out, make build these rows two months before you plant in them because that soil is going to harden back up on you again and you're going to have trouble getting that planter in the ground. And you're going to have trouble closing the earth up or back around it. So, you know, th these were only put in a couple weeks before we actually planted in them. So that's real important. Yes, sir. What, how many layers is your plastic? Is it wide on wide? Is it wide on top and black on the bottom? Or wide, wide on top and black on the bottom. A wide <laughs> on white fabric would let, or plastic would let weeds, you'd still be feeding the weeds and they'd be coming through. So the reason it's white is because hemp is going to go dormant if it gets too hot. If you put black plastic on that, they go dormant in the summertime when they're needing to, you know, especially during flowering. So um, the white keeps it cool. So we had nice, you could actually put your hand under the plastic in August and the earth was nice and cool. Real nice temperature. So there's my planting supervisor right there. <laughs> But you can see this is uh, relatively early on. And you can see the weeds already coming into play in that soil. Um, you can barely see it, but you can see our irrigation lines up here. So what we did is we just split the field. So one header irrigated this, sec this half of the field. The, the other header irrigated that half of the field. Yes, sir. Did you uh, experience the black plastic summer dormancy yourself? No, no, no. You heard about that? Or yeah, we heard about that. Okay. And that, you know, when you look at temperatures mm -hmm. and you talk to even people that are doing tomatoes and that sort of thing, I mean, black plastic is great depending on what time it'll get you in the ground earlier, mm -hmm. but then on the other side of that is the summer moves on, you know, so if it's a crop that's going to be going through late summer, then you, you're, you're going to have issues. And the reflection back up from the white doesn't cause any problems for you? Not at all. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Maybe it did. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't think it did. I think it did. And then um, my rose will be straighter this year. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't drinking. I was really trying to make them straight, but you know, a little gaggle over here turns into a huge one over here. So, but um, that's just a, a, a look back out. And then you can see uh, signage. You know, we're, we're in a very remote area, very protected, but signage is critical as part of your, you know, security plan. And this one just has our license number. And this is almost more for in this area, it's more for law enforcement than it is for uh, somebody trying to raid the field. This, this is just, these, we had these spaced several places around the field, all the corners and then in the middles, just to make sure that you know, anybody that came across this understands that this is, a, this is hemp. They aren't gonna get high. And it's a licensed field. You see how nice the Johnson grass is going here as well. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of a panel we're going to drop early on, and then a little bit later. So why, yes. why can't you just take a mulching mower and mow in plastic rows or whatever? Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. You just keeps the grass down the mower. Yeah. Absolutely. Does it but, any bugs grow in that grass that's going to affect Well, that's, you know, depending on what, <coughs> what type of weed or what type of plant it is, yeah, you're going to have different things growing there. You're going to be feeding, you may not be feeding beneficial insects, you may be feeding an insect that, hey, it likes him too. The other thing is, is what we were talking about earlier, is disturbing those, that soil and trying to, trying to break that up too is, is key. So, but, but mowing between it, um, I know a few folks that mowed between it. 
But the real, the issue too is, as that plant gets larger, you think about, you know, we're going to basically have 10 feet between our plants. But if you have a three foot from this side and a three foot from this side, now I've got four feet that I've got to get a tractor through. And that's why what Bill's talking about, doing the mule and the cultivator, because that mule, you, know, you get skinny mules, they're just real tall. And that's what you use is a skinny mule. And you'll get, you're going to get that down through there. So um, that's, and that's another issue. So you know you may have to look at putting sideboards on the wheels of your tractor and that sort of thing. So you don't you know roll over your plant. You just kind of slide them out of the way. Um, this is getting on in the season. They've already started to flower. Get some pretty good flowering going here. And there's my son to get a kind of a reference. There's my son who's sitting down, so you can't tell but how how large these are. Now let's talk about fertilization real quick. Um, we went with a cannabis specific fertilizer because we wanted to make sure, I mean we could have mixed it ourselves, we've got those recipes out there, but we went with a cannabis specific fertilizer because for the cost and the benefit, it's almost a no brainer. And everybody has their favorite cannabis you know, uh, fertilizer. We went to Fox Farms because we have experience with that, with cannabis. Um, we used the Grow Big during the vegetative cycle, and then we switched to the Big Bloom, which will do Tiger Bloom this year. Yes. You're injecting it? Your yes. Drip lines? Yeah, we're going through the drip lines. So we'll use Tiger Bloom this year because it's a little more friendly to your drip lines. We had to filter the, the Big Bloom last year, uh, filter the seven now. So what we did, we were able to do every 10 days, we were able to use, on this on 6,500 plants, so you can kind of ratio it from there. But again, you know, write this down if you want to, but just keep in mind, you've got to watch your plants. You've got to be observant of what your plants are doing, and that's going to tell you if you need to feed them more or you're feeding them too much. So we used a five-gallon container of the Grow Big, put that in a 55-gallon drum of water, and injected it in, to our plants. Now what we did to make sure that we got equal fertilization to all the plants, even the ones on the end, is we pre-charge each header for five minutes. And then we start the injection process. We'd inject half of the drum, and then we shut the injector off and do a post-flush for five minutes on the line. And then we do the same thing for the other header, for the upper part of the field. Um, and that worked perfectly. Doing that every 10 days was just right for what we were doing. Now, when you start to flower, you don't immediately switch over to Big Bloom or, grow, or the, a, a blooming fertilizer or flowering fertilizer because one of the things that causes THC to go high is certain fertilizers. Now, lots of cannabis fertilizers are designed to make your cannabinoids really uh, go high, especially if you're doing, you know, marijuana. So you have, and this is a cannabis uh, fertilizer. So what we did was we kept doing the grow big two more cycles, and then we started in on the on the uh, the flowering fertilizer, and then about two three weeks later is when our Department of Agriculture representative showed up and sampled our plants. Because you don't want to grow, you don't want to really hit them hard with a flowering fertilizer for say a month before your representative shows up to sample your field. Because you're gonna, you're gonna be near or over that limit of 0.3. Now that's variety dependent. Um, that's why it's real important that when you you get your plants, you go, now what is this plant, this corn I'm getting, or this seed? Okay, and you go back and you plant it. You need to know what that plant's gonna do. You need to talk to some other growers that are using that, those same plants to see where they're at and what they're doing. I would never attempt to tell you how to grow Bill's plants or Franklin or anything else like that, but I will tell you what worked with ours and how, and how they respond. <coughs> Some more of our plants. See the Johnson grass right there? 
So they are competing. <coughs> so, but nice full plants. Um, again, not as much light down near the bottom as we'd like to see. So that's that's the other reason to spread them out. But you can see nice heavy buds, good flowering. Some real pretty, pretty buds there too. And then harvesting. Now with putting them so close, we've walked 100 miles in this field back and forth. Because yeah, you can go up and down them with a you know a trailer and a truck, but the problem is is they all don't mature necessarily at the right at exactly the same time. So you're going in the field and based on you know the maturation of trichome is where you're gonna start. So look at beneficial insects, look at beneficial nematodes, look at breaking these cycles because a lot of these uh, bugs, these pests, these insects, have a, have a life cycle that encompasses going into the ground. Well, if there's, if there's something that you put in the ground that can interrupt that cycle, then you're going to be way ahead. Um, the, corn, the only problems we had this last year were the corn borers, or corn ear worms, and we had a little bit of powdery mildew. That's it, or southern powdery mildew, whatever you want to call it. We only had you know five or ten plants with that on it, but uh, the corn ear worms were a different story, so we had to really fight them. Um, so again, you know the best time to do that is don't ever let the don't ever let the eggs get on your plant. So that doesn't mean you put you know they have bait stations or bait traps for them, your pheromone traps. I wouldn't put them around my field. I'd put them somewhere way away and let them go over there. Um, you don't want to call them to your field. And then again, just really paying attention, looking for eggs, looking for different things like that um, early on. Um, this is an early part of the harvest. When we were hanging them, um, trying to figure out how we were going to dry because we had that oh crap moment that kind of Bill was talking about that you're going to have if you have 1,400. Christmas trees out there that you have to figure out what you're going to do with. And so we have that. And the fact of the matter is we didn't have a, a dry fall. We had an incredibly wet fall. And so when it's raining outside and you're building this, the same humidity inside as it is outside, that plant's not going to dry. Now, if it does start to dry, then when your humidity cycles at night, the plant's going to pull them back in. And so what happens when it, it keeps giving up moisture and pulling it back in is the plant material degrades. And you are going to have the same quality that you might have had. And you start talking losing one or two points of CBD percentage, you know, we're talking that's, that's three bucks a pound, three, four bucks a pound that you start to lose on a product that you've worked real hard on. So what we did is we built racks my construction supervisor. And he, he's the one that has the traumatic brain injury. So we built these racks, they're just out of two by fours, and then we put uh, a quarter inch hardware cloth on those, and then assembled those like shelves on eight foot two by fours and cross braced them real quick. And we had drawing racks, <coughs> and we set these up in the room. Right here, we just set them up. And we had uh, about 3,500 square feet of these racks set up. And then we had dehumidifiers running and, or, and fans. And so we kept that area at about 50 to 60% humidity, lots of air movement. And so we could dry, um, you know, each one of these shelves takes about 30 pounds of wet material, which equates to about five pounds of dry material. So we could dry these shelves of product in a week. So they'd go from about 85% moisture to 10% moisture in about, well, just under a week, doing it this way. Now what we're doing is we're actually stripping these plants. This is a little plate we made out of aluminum, and we put a bucket down below and clip 
all the main stems off of the stalk, and then we just drag them through this real quick. Now we, this is called wet bucking. And the reason we did wet bucking um, is because there's a lot of moisture in the stalk and stem. So when you hang a product, and you hang this plant by the stalk and stem, all the moisture goes out of the stalk, into the stem, out the leaves and bud. Does the wet bucking destroy your trichomes? No. Dry bucking knocks your trichomes off. Does it say it's full of good right? Your trichomes. Nope, not at all. So what happens is you pull this through and it builds up. So your first leaves build up on the on the on this side of the plate. Plates here, it builds up on this side of the plate, and your buds just kind of stack up and then fall off in the bucket. So beautifully simple and effective, lots of labor. I didn't live on the West Coast, we use a hot machine. Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yep. Yep. So anyways, um, this worked real well. We, could, we, we, we were able to buck an incredible amount of material every day, yes. Sir, how thick can you stack on your drawing rack? How About two inches max. So you want to see some daylight through them. Real important. Because at this stage, you know, in October, the, the, these plants, if you, we, we found this out the hard way with a few of them, if you cut too many on Monday and you stack a few, we'll get those tomorrow, and you stack them over in the corner, the next morning when you come in, some, there's going to be some mold on some of those. So you've got to get airflow to these things immediately. And so we made sure that we, you know, after that we had it down to a pretty good um, pace where we were emptying racks and filling racks and keeping everything full and moving through. So real important. So we have eight or nine of these. And people to match them. And we had people, you know, stripping and people cutting and people harvesting. So we had between 10 and 12 people working for about eight weeks. Um, so here we are. And part of it. Nice thing is they're starting up. If you stand on the edges, you can crawl up there and stack your stuff however you want. Now, um, this is hanging in there with some of our extraction equipment. So this is our, one of our extractor lines right here. And then a cryogenic chiller there for it. Um, one of the real important things, well, what Bill was saying about harvesting and drying can't be understated. Um, that's where most people are going to lose it. You know, the weeds are going to get a lot of folks. It's like just attrition during a road race. You know, the heat's going to get some folks, the hills are going to get some folks, and, you know, there's other things to get the rest. So, it's real important that you plan properly. So, when I say, like, these racks, going back to these racks right here, so, you know, like with our varieties, <coughs> I plan for five pounds per plant. I count on getting three if I do things right. So if, I, if I've got a thousand plants, that's potentially 5,000 pounds of dry material that I need to plant on. So that means, and I'm gonna end over, we'll say an eight week period. So if I'm drying, getting them through every week, that means I've got eight turns on 5,000 pounds. Are you turning your racks every morning, like flipping it? No, it no, yeah. Because you start flipping them and doing that, you're going to lose trichomes big time. So if I've, I've got, say, 5,000 pounds, I've got eight weeks to do this in, that's going to give me six turns, basically. That will give me 4,800 pounds, right? So, or I can do eight, six turns, so that's going to give me like 800 pounds, 850 pounds a week dried that's got to come off. So if I'm going to get five pounds per rack dried, that means... <laughs> I've got to have like what, 7,580 of these shelves. Oops. So I've got to have 180 of these shelves right here. The base yeah. of those shelves is that wire, or is it? It's hardware wire? cloth. Yeah, it's wire. It's quarter-inch hardware cloth. So I've got to have 180 of these shelves 
to get that much off of there. So if I can get, now we've got it set up now where we can get, you know, on a 10 foot two by four, we can get 10 shelves. So that means I've got 50 pounds coming off every week off of 32 square feet of floor space. Now if I put them end to end and just leave a little aisle in the middle, it comes out to about 50 square feet. So I'm getting 50 pounds every 50 square feet for a week. So if I've got to get, let's see here, 5,000, I've got to get 850 pounds. So now I've got to have, I'm going to get 50 here. So that means I need what, 16, 17 of these racks times 50 square feet. So I'm looking at, you know, roughly a thousand square feet of humidity controlled space just for 5,000 pounds off of a thousand plants. Everybody says a thousand plants, that's not much. That's a lot of product to dry, to harvest, to buck. So really think carefully about what you're getting into because the saddest thing in the world is to see beautiful plants sitting in your field you can't do anything about. And we experienced some of that. We had a few hundred plants in the field we couldn't do anything about. Because all the barns were full and all the drying space was taken up. So you just have to say, well, I'm going to plan differently next year. This year we're at the size that we're doing a, a large, what's called a mesh belt dryer. And so that's what we've got to, that's what we've invested in this year for the drying process. Because we want good, high quality dry product because that's what the market demands. Now there's going to be a, always going to be low quality product out there. Lots of folks <coughs> have large acreages. Um, they just ran a silage chopper through it and then dried it, you know, real harshly. Now I'll just tell you, there's lots of 6% and 8% material out there that was done that way that's available cheap. But product that was dried properly and sorted properly commands a premium. There's a lot of good product out there too. There's a lot of bad product, you know, low, I would say that lower quality product, there's plenty of that out there, but there's also a lot of high quality product out there too. So what you've got to do is you've got to look at your labor. What are you putting into each pound of this plant? And you do your costing and your cost analysis. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be going backwards. What I've told folks that are growing for us this year is you know, this year, this, this coming year, they can probably count on 20 to 25 dollars a pound. Now that's not saying that's what's going to happen, but that's just reality. Right now, it's running 32.50 to 40 a pound for 10 percent product. And the main the main driver of that price is what's coming out of Oregon. So. You know, next year it may be $15, or this coming year, you know, it may be $15 a pound coming right out into September, October, November. So you've got to think about storage too. Because if you can hang on to your product into, you know, May, June, July, August, before the, you know, the, the next year's <coughs> crop is harvested, well, then maybe you'll get more for your product. So storage is really critical. These are all factors you need to think about. This isn't, you know, there's some players in this game now that are huge. And so, you know, we've got to figure out ways to be more efficient with our labor, with our production, and with producing a good quality product. Any other questions? I hope I've discouraged some of you folks that are going to go out and do several thousand plants. You know, back down to some reality. I hate to be harsh about it, but back to a little bit of reality of, you know, okay, I'm gonna do a thousand plants, but I'm going into this knowing what I'm gonna be facing. Yes, sir. How big a piece of ground did you, were you working with this crop? Okay, we did 6,500 plants on roughly six acres. We're going, we're expanding massively to 7,200 plants on 12 acres this year. So, not much more expansion in numbers, but a great a greater focus on efficiency and production. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Well, dairy. We did not have deer either. We have tons of deer and turkey. I'm now, about to talk a little more. The first one was very Okay. Well, the, the southern deer yeah. like sweet tea. They don't like him. <laughs> yeah, sure. West Coast deer, the the, the mule well, deer, evidently, is like. And I don't have problems with the oil coming off their fur on my plants. And the okay. oil reaction with the plant itself. So. Okay. Interesting. Well, we didn't have any problems. Various the tobacco worms. Yes. Tobacco worms, yes. I didn't see any, we didn't have any trouble with grasshoppers. We had corn ear worms and a couple other types of worms that we had to deal with. You said those are black white not can they not? I don't know. Because I know a few caterpillars you go in the test the black white not gone and they'll just light up. Okay. I'm gonna try that. that. Yes, sir. What's the main reasons for you going down in um, uh, both those weeds, harvesting, being able to get to the plants much easier and inspect them, pest control, and then also making sure we've got more airflow in there. One variety that we grew, which was called frosted lime, has a huge dense bud, and you would just need a lot of air movement around that to prevent any mold issues. Now we didn't have really any mold issues. We had a little bud rot, but it was from the caterpillars. <coughs> but we got on that early, not early enough, but we got on pretty early and took care of that. Yes, sir. I was a bike controller for about 50 years. I was always pretty good. I don't know about the hemp. Do you, do you let this, when you cut it, do you let it wilt like we do the bike before you strain it or not? No, we get right on it. What you got on it? We, we, we got right on it. We didn't, our, our model was cut it, <clears throat> get a trailer load, take it straight up to the processing area, start breaking it down and bucking it and get it immediately on the racks. So it probably an hour, two hours max from when it was cut in the field to when it was sitting on a rack. Does it sunburn very quick if you leave it after you cut it in the field like the biker? Well, I don't, I don't know in, in comparison to tobacco, I don't know. But what happens is the sun starts oxidizing that plant, and so, you know, like just like what Bill was saying, there's some horrible looking product out there that's all burnt up and oxidized, and there's some beautiful looking ice cream product. So you really need to keep the sunlight off of it. <coughs> I've seen vertical rack drying. Are any better, more efficient? The problem is, is we're, we're, we're almost taking half of the moisture away from that plant by getting the stems and the stalk out of the, out of the picture. The other thing is, it opens it up. So you have a giant, you have a big, you know, a bud or a cola, and it's all tightly packed on that stem. Well, when you pull that stem out of it, it's gonna kinda come apart and have much more surface area to dry. <coughs> So that's what our focus was, is trying to dry this quickly. Low temperature, the other thing is, you want to keep it below 90 degrees Fahrenheit during your drying, you're going to start evaporating off some of your terpenes and some of your cannabinoids. So the ideal is 50% humidity and around 60 degrees. Because again, the lower the temperature, you start having less problem from mold. You know, if you keep that thing at 90 degrees and 75, 80% humidity, it's going to mold overnight. But you drop it down, and it's gonna start drying really rapidly. 